Hi, welcome to another tutorial on enzyme kinetics. This one is going to be in two parts. This is part one, and I'm going to start a discussion on uh, ligand binding and the ADAIR model. So this will involve uh, the idea of cooperativity. So let me motivate this with two slides from part two. Um, this picture you see here is a picture of a molecule of hemoglobin. Uh, of course, hemoglobin carries oxygen in the blood. And hemoglobin, the protein hemoglobin, is made up of two, uh, four smaller proteins. There's one here, one here, one here, and one here. Two of the proteins are called the alpha subunits and are identical, and the other two are called beta subunits. They're slightly different. And these are arranged in a sort of fashion like this. And in each subunit, you'll see uh, this, I don't know if you can see it in the image, but there's a there's another molecule which is called the porphyrin ring. And it's this that carries a, uh, can carry a single molecule of oxygen. There's four of them, one here, 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 and here. And so a single molecule of hemoglobin can carry four oxygen molecules. Now, what's interesting about hemoglobin is the way it responds to different levels of oxygen. So this is a plot here of the percentage saturation, in other words, how many oxygens are basically bound to the hemoglobin. So down here we have very few oxygens bound, up here we have uh, all four oxygens bound. And then the x-axis measures the oxygen partial pressure, effectively the concentration of oxygen uh, in the media. So we see this strange S-shaped curve Okay, also known as a sigmoid curve. It's not like the hyperbolic curve you see in enzyme kinetics. Um, many enzymes and proteins, such as hemoglobin, show this kind of characteristic S-shaped curve. Uh, it has functional importance. So, for example, in the lungs, here, this is the level of oxygen in the lungs, and we see that hemoglobin is fully saturated with oxygen. All four sites are, are saturated. Down here at about 40... Um, uh, partial, oxygen partial pressure. Uh, we see that some of the oxygen has come off. It's a rough, almost just above 50% saturation. Now you see that this point here is very steep. So the idea is when the when the hemoglobin travels to the tissues where the oxygen level is lower, uh, it's very easy for the oxygen to uh, sorry, it's very easy for the hemoglobin to dump the oxygen, which is exactly what you want in tissues. Whereas in the lungs, you want the hemoglobin to take up as much oxygen as possible. So this has been this is, has been evolved to cope with different levels of oxygen to make sure that oxygen gets dropped where it's needed in the tissues. So the question is, how does this sigmoid behavior come about? And over the years, maybe the last hundred years, I guess, there have been many m models that are being proposed to try to explain how this curve comes about. And so that's what we're going to talk about in uh, this tutorial. Now, to begin with, though, we'll need to do some theory. So let me start uh, with that. Um, first, though, let me mention uh, a word on notation. You've seen this before. Uh, when I use a capital letter for a chemical species, I'm, what I'm referring to is the name of the chemical species. When I use its lowercase equivalent, such as little e, I mean to represent the concentration of the species. And the reason I do this, and some other, some other authors do the same, uh, normally you're probably used to using square brackets to signify concentration. Uh, well, you know, problem with square brackets, they tend to clutter up the equations. And you'll see we'll have some fairly big equations in this tutorial. So rather than have square brackets all, all, all over the place, I decided just to use uh, an italics small letter to indicate the concentration. And two ideas that are very, very important for this tutorial, which I'm sure you're aware of, but let's review anyway. And that is the, uh, the idea of an equilibrium constant. Let's say we have a bimolecular reaction, A plus B combines to form some kind of complex AB. We can, uh, we can describe the equilibrium constant for that as AB, the complex AB divided by A times B. And this is, this is called the association constant. And it's called the association constant because A and B from left to right are associating to form the complex. Okay, we, we often symbolize this with the letter Ka. Now the reverse process, if I were to switch the, the bimolecular reaction round, so I start with AB on the left, and that dissociates into A and B, then the equilibrium constant for this from left to right 
is a times b divided by ab. And we call this the dissociation constant because the reaction is dissociating in the direct in the left to right direction. Now you've probably spotted that these two constants, Ka and Kd, are the reciprocal of each other. Okay, you can see that from here, they're just the reciprocal of each other. So if you know one, you automatically know the other. Now, although I'm using capital K here, I will be using capital K in future, but sometimes I'll use a lowercase ka or kd, depending on context, and that will be clear when we come to it. Okay, so these are two important ideas we need, need to remember. Okay, so let's start by uh, talking about ligand binding to identical sites. So here I have a protein that's a dimer it's got two identical subunits and on these subunits then there's some active site which can bind ligand s now these sites are identical so binding to either on the left or the right is um, has the same strength of binding so we can write down now we can write down dimer plus ligand gives a bound ligand you notice that i bound it to the left side okay um, it can also unbind, of course. S can be released from the dimer to produce free dimer and free ligand. Now we can define a, an equilibrium constant for this process. Um, it's an association constant because we're going from undissociated to dissociated. Um, and I'm going to call for ligand binding where we have multiple potential sites. I'm going to call the association constant, the microscopic association constant. That'll become clear shortly. And I'll define it as the concentration of bound ligand, this one, divided by the concentration of free dimer times free substrate. So this is where I'm using lowercase k. So whenever you see a lowercase k, you know I'm referring to a microscopic association constant. And I know you're wondering why I'm calling it that. Well, I'll show you in a minute now. So this is called the microscopic association constant. Now, of course, there are two sites on the dimer. So we've already seen the, the ligand binding to the left side. But of course, the ligand could bind equally to the right side. Okay. Um, now, because the sites are identical, they must have the same microscopic uh, dis dissociation constant, that should be a dissociation constant. should have the same microscopic dissociation constant. Now I can turn this diagram into something that looks like this. Okay, so let's look at it from this point of view. So we have fully unbound dimer. It can either bind with ligand to form S, can bind to the left-hand sub, um, subunit, or ligand combined to the right-hand subunit. I'm not putting in the ligands here explicitly, but they're implied in the diagram, okay? Now, I can also describe these microscopic uh, so association constants in pictorial form. So the microscopic constant for the upper arm is the concentration of this form divided by the free times the substrate concentration, or the microscopic constant for the lower arm is the dimer with the right-hand ligand bound divided by the same denominator. These are identical constants, okay? Because there's no real difference between these, although we, I said, you know, one binds to the left, one binds to the right. Actually, there's no difference in terms of uh, kinetics, whether it binds on the left or the right. Now, once uh, the first site has been filled, of course, we can fill the other site. And so we can complete the figure like this. So here we have the fully empty dimer. It can bind one ligand and then the other ligand can bind, or it can bind the ligand on the other, su other subunit and then fill in the ligand uh, likewise. It's important to bear in mind, because we're dealing with identical sites, that all the microscopic association constants are equal to each other. So there's, there's one, two, three, four microscopic association constants. And because the, the binding sites are all identical, all the microscopic association constants will be equal to. But there's a problem. 
Uh, now experimentally, I can't actually distinguish between these two, right? If I manage, if I could look down a microscope and I could see these dimers, I couldn't tell you whether it was this one or this, or this one I was looking at, because they're basically identical and they're completely symmetrical. So there are actually, if I were to measure the concentration of singly bound ligand, I would end up measuring the total concentration of these two site of these two states. So. What we end up with is there are actually only three measurable states in the system. That is fully unbound, which is this one, fully bound, which is this one, and half bound, which are these two. Okay, now you recall that uh, when I defined the association, the microscopic association constants, the numerator had only one of them. Now, of course, I can't measure these though. So these uh, association constants aren't actually measurable, okay? But they're the actual true association constants. If I could somehow measure these states, I could get hold of these true uh, association constants. So what do we do? Well, we can define. Well, let me just show you. In, uh, let me just turn this into symbols. So these are the three. These are the three states: fully unbound. Sorry, fully un. Yeah, fully unbound. Fully bound and then the sum of the two bound states. And I'm gonna call these D10 or T01, okay? So I'm gonna use this terminology, D00 for fully unbound, D11 for fully bound, and then the partially bound ones are D10, D01, depending on which uh, side of the ligand is bound. And what's measurable, of course, is the total. Okay, I can only measure the total. So if I were to measure the total, I actually have to describe a different kind of association constant, which is the total divided by the unbound times the ligand concentration. And I'll call these, I'll call this constant the, a macroscopic association constant. And this will, and I'll use the capital K in this case. Now there's another one, K2. So let me go back to this diagram here. There's one macro uh, association constant uh, that's associated with the left side and there's another uh, macro dissociation constant associated with the, the right side. So the left side I will call K1, the right side I will call K2 and that's what I'm referring to here. So K1 is the left hand association constant so that's the total of the partially bound divided by the unbound times the ligand concentration. And on the right side, I have the other macroscopic association constant, which is now the fully bound divided by the uh, sum of the partially bound times the uh, ligand concentration. In symbol form, if I use those D form, D terminology, I get these two, K1 and K2. Okay. Now, the big question now is, what's the relationship then between the microscopic and the macroscopic? Now the macroscopic I can measure, the microscopic I can't, but the microscopic tells me more detail about the individual binding events, whereas the macroscopic doesn't. Now in terms of the, uh, the new notation, the D notation, the microscopic association constants are given by these, these relations. So it's D10, which is this, divided by D00 times ligand, and the Ka on this side, um, or oh, the other Ka of this one here is D01 divided by D00 times the ligand concentration. And because again, these are identical sites, the two Ka's are the same. So let's investigate then the relationship between the microscopic and the macroscopic association constants. So I just wrote these two out on the previous page. Okay, so these are the microscopic association constants. And then this one, this big K1, is this macro association constant here. So I want to know what's the relationship between these two. So first thing I'll do is I'll take this term and I'll bring this, the denominator, up to the uh, left-hand side. So I end up with this. Then I'll take a D0 away, a D01 away from both sides and I end up with this. So I get D10 equals K1 D0 times S minus D01. Now I'm going to take this, or rather this, and substitute it into here, okay? If I do that, you, there's some fairly simple arrangements you can do. You end up with this. 
Okay, now I can do the same for the other one, for K2, and I'll end up with this relation. So, what's surprising here is that the microscopic and macroscopic association constants are different. So K1, which was the left-hand side microscopic association constant, is 2 times Ka, and the right the right-hand one is half Ka. Now this is a statistical effect and it's due to the fact that there are two ways for the first ligand to bind, but there's only one way for the second to bind. So what I mean by that, let me get the diagram, there are two ways for the ligand to bind on the left side. So it can either bind to the left subunit or bind to the right-hand uh, right subunit. But there's only one way for it to unbind. Okay, And just this uh, observation gives us a very noticeable macroscopic effect even though the microscopic binding constants are identical. Right, so what's interesting about this, the, we're dealing with identical sites, but the macroscopic, the measurable uh, association constants are different. Okay. Alright, now what happened now, uh, up to now I just had two binding sites. What happens if we have uh, N binding sites, maybe a tetramer and so on? So let's consider a macromolecule M uh, with N binding sites for ligand S. Okay, so before we had a macromolecule with two binding sites. As before, we'll assume that each site has the same microscopic dissociation constant, uh, KD. I'm going to talk about dissociation constants here, you'll see why. KD. And of course, it's independent of the number of ligands bound. So it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, if I had a 10, I've had a protein with 10 binding sites, it doesn't matter whether there are nine ligand, ligands bound or two ligands bound, the KD will be the same in each case. It basically means that the subunits are behaving as if they were uh, independent subunits and not at all associated with a complex. Now I'm going to use the special symbol here, MI, to denote the constant total concentration of the microscopic state with I-bound ligands. So, just to make that clear, for example, M1 is the total concentration of all states with one ligand bound. M2 is the total concentration of all states with two ligands bound. And what does that mean? Well, here, here are two examples uh, in, in pictorial form. So, let's say we had a tetramer, that's four subunits. If I were to, bi if I were to bind a one ligand, you can see there are four ways to bind those four ligands. And so M1 is the concentration of all four. Uh, if I had a tetramer and I bound two ligands, there are now more ways of binding two ligands than there were to, bi uh, there were to bind one ligand. So I can bind two ligands like this, like this, like this, like this, or diagonally. So there's six of them. And the total concentrations of states that can bind two ligands is the sum of all six. And I can go M3 and M4. In fact, um, I have the all the all the combinations here on this slide. Right, this is for when n equals four. Uh, obviously, there's only one state when there's nothing bound. There's only one state when they're all bound. But there's four states for M1. Uh, there's four states for M3, and there's six states for M2. Okay. All right. Now. Um, one question to ask is, how can we compute this number? I mean, there's four here, there's six here, there's four here, and so on. How can we, how can we figure out that there's actually six here? Well, this, this comes down to um, some combinatorial mathematics. So the number of possible states for a given number of ligands can be calculated uh, using the combinations uh, formula. So, for example, uh, for a macromolecule with n sites, the number of ways C place I ligands is given by this uh, the combination equation. Okay, so this is a standard equation in mathematics. If, uh, if you're not sure what this is, if this is, just look up combinations and permutations and you'll find uh, this listed under the combinations entry. This here is just a shorthand notation because this is a bit long-winded. Often you'll see this as a shorthand notation for representing this function. Okay, so give you an example, and this is a very really simple one we'll start off with. Let's consider a dimer like we had before, and the number of sites, of course, is two. And let's say we just want to place one ligand onto a site. How many ways 
are there to place uh, one ligand onto two sides. So I've got a dimer. How many ways is it possible to place one ligand? Well, I can place it on the left or I can place it on the, on the right. So there should be two. So if I put two into that formula, the combination formula, I get two. Okay, so that, that works out. Uh, I can try another one. Let's say we have a tetrama that has four binding sites. And what happens if I have two ligands? So I enter that into the combination formula and it tells me there are six possible ways to arrange two ligands in four sites. So that's how we can get uh, these numbers. So these numbers here, right, one, four, six, four, one, we can easily compute these from the combination formula. Okay. Now let's look at um, the uh, the macroscopic dissociation constant Ki between two configurations. So if I have two configurations m1 and m minus one, so for example m1 dissociates into m minus one and, and ligand s, the macroscopic dissociation constant, of course, is the product of the left side divided by the uh, right uh, product of the right side divided by the left side. Okay, so that's the macroscopic dissociation constant for this uh, reaction here for these two states, M i and M minus 1. Okay, now I'm going to make um, a reasonable assumption here for any given configuration M i, such as this one. Okay, I'm going to assume that if I were to look at any instant in time, there's an equal probability of finding this state, this state, this state, or this state, or this state, or this state. Okay, so I'm assuming that at any instant in time there are equal concentrations of each state. Okay, right. Especially this is the case since the all the states are kinetically identical. Remember, we said that there's no difference in binding strength between the between the states. Yeah, between the uh, the ligand binding. Okay, given that, I can then compute the average concentration within a given uh, state. So the average concentration is the concentration of the total divided by the number of states. And of course, we know that the number of states is this, CNI, and I know that the total concentration is MI. So this is the average concentration of, of this state of two, ligand, two ligands in this state. Okay? So remember that, right? So the average concentration is the total concentration divided by the number of states. Now, what about the microscopic dissociation constant? So here I just gave you the macroscopic dissociation constant. Here I'm going to show, give you the microscopic dissociation constant. So again, um, we know that the concentration of a particular state in configuration M, M, Mi is little mi divided by that. And so the micros microscopic dissociation constant for this process is the average concentration on the right side times the ligand divided by the average concentration uh, on the left side. Okay. So now I have these two. I've now computed the microscopic and the macroscopic dissociation constants. All right, and I can combine these two uh, in such a way that I can eliminate S in both cases. When I do that, I get this relationship. And I guess this is um, one of the main results. This gives me, in general, for a uh, protein that has N binding sites, the relationship between the microscopic uh, dissociation constant, in this case, and the macroscopic dissociation constant. Now there is a, there's a result in binomial coefficients where um, uh, dividing these one by the other actually gives you a fairly simple result. In fact, I can replace uh, this whole thing by this. So this is just a general result if you go look in mathematics and look at binomial coefficients and permutations and combinations, you find that we can replace this ratio, the ratio of these two, with this. Now, of course, in terms of association constants, I just invert everything. All right, so it becomes a reciprocal. So in terms of association constants, I would write this. In terms of dissociation constants, I would write that. So this is the result we're looking, these are the results we're looking for. The relationship uh, between the macroscopic and microscopic constants for N binding sites. 
Okay, so that completes part one. This we'll be using these results in part two. So I'll close off there and then move on to part two. Thank you.